Barrow and Furness, which was once a hamlet, became a large industrial and dock town in the 19th centenary. Its main trade was iron and steel, and in doing so became the largest of these metals in the world. With the introduction of the railway here, its prosperity grew along with the development of steel and shipbuilding industries. Standing at the heart of the town is the impressive town hall, with its clock tower that can be viewed on the hills away from the town centre. The building opened in 1887 by W. H. Lynn in the modern Gothic style. Adjacent from the mainland is the Isle of Walney, 10 miles long and reputedly reported as the windiest lowland site in Britain. Our journey doesn't begin on the A595, but on the 590, so it seems appropriate to start our journey on the Isle of Walney. We leave the Roundhouse restaurant and travel down Ocean Road. Notice the generous width of the formation. Barrow is well populated, housing 80,000 residents but the island itself has a staggering population of 10,000. The island itself has a hive of activity, with a golf course along with its nature reserve located beyond the island's airport, which is a private airport operated by the BAE Systems Marine Limited. Here the road crosses over the Walney Bridge, or Jubilee Bridge, which connects the island with the mainland. Proposals for a connection to the island had arisen in 1897. The construction began in 1905, with completion on the 30th of June 1908. The 343 metre long bridge used to carry the Barrow Tramway right up until its closure in 1932. The massive building you can see to our right is the Devonshire Dock Hall, which specialises in the construction of various Royal Navy vessels, for example submarines. cross over the Cumbrian coastline which follows our route one way or another all the way to Carlisle. The line is 85.5 miles in length and runs a train service of one train every two hours between Barrow and Carlisle and every hour from Barrow to Lancaster with some heading onwards to Manchester. Just northwest of this location is the Sandscale Hawes Nature Reserve. 282 hectares and home to a rare species, the Natterjack Toad. Management comes from the National Trust authorities. At this roundabout, the second exit leads back towards the town centre. It also runs past Furness Abbey, more of which in a second, whilst here we cross the railway for a second time. Furness Abbey is 900 years old and has a rich history since its founding in 1125 and was built by the classic red sandstone bricks, a popular feature of many historical buildings in Cumbria, like as we've already said, Barrow's Town Hall. It's such a shame that the building is not in its original full condition as the abbey was destroyed by King Henry VIII during the English Reformation in 1537. 
A third time we crossed the railway line exactly where the Barrow avoiding line, or in other words, Dalton Curve, converges. As stated, it avoids Barrow Station altogether, with freight trains plying the rail bypass daily to reach the nuclear power station at Sellafield. It's ironic, as between Dalton Junction and Park South Junction, located at the third crossing, is less than one mile, however the passenger loop is over eight miles. Note the overtaking lane on the right, used in both directions, however we ride in the crawler lane for slower moving vehicles. This roundabout is the start of the A595. Our 86 mile journey from here begins with the additional 5 from Walney Island. The 590 continues east to connect up with the M6 south of Kendall. Countdown marker boards warn of an approach to a 30 miles per hour section. Ascom and Erlith are the two small villages located on this road, the latter village being the oldest and smallest. Ascom village was founded back in the 1850s with the discovery of iron ore. Although they have both been merged into one, both villages share a station on the Cumbrian coastline served by Northern yet the company has favoured Ascom to be the name of their station as it does have the larger population than Erlith. A sharp 90 degree turn takes us into Erlith. Travelling through the Lake District, one of many national parks to have been amalgamated in 1951. Sixteen lakes in total form the Lake District, the largest being Lake Windermere at Bowness on Windermere. Current surveys suggest that nearly 15.8 million tourists a year visit the lakes, with the majority of them come to visit the scenery, the peace and quiet from the busy cities, and others come for the attractions. Out of interest, Wastewater Lake, a few miles from Gosforth, is the deepest, at 260 metres. On the horizon, we can see the mountain range of the Lake District Fells, which contains three of the highest peaks, reaching well over 3,000 feet in altitude. Unlike the first road trip view with the A5 from London to Holyhead, our route's history is quite bleak, but what we do know is that throughout its length it's known as the Cumbrian Coast Route. 1946 was the year the road first opened, but did so in stages, with the first section being between Carlisle and Thursby, the second to Lily Hall in Workington, which is now the A596, and the third to Grisbeck section however to Grisbeck we shall never be 100% sure. As we know already the main competition is the railway. Now at this point is running a little closer to the edge of the shore and on a much straighter course. Thinking about it though if a car and train left Barrow around the same time for Carlisle they're both sure to make it into Carlisle around the same time, as the average time distance is 2 hours and 25 minutes without any delays. The name Furness is a peninsula that covers an area of 567 square kilometres, known with two distinctive parts, High and Low Furness, Low referring to the villages and settlements around the peninsula, rivers Duddon and Leven, whereas the high is to the sparsely mountainous areas stretching inland towards the Lake District and Furness Fells. This is Soutergate.
five miles from Barrow, we approached the village of Kirkby and Furness. The name Kirkby can be traced back into Norse days, along with the parish of Kirkby Erleth, reaching as far back as the Doomsday Book of 1086. The village took in the name Furness from the railway company, as incidentally the people responsible for building the Cumbrian coastline between Barrow to Foxfield were called the Furness Railway Company. Apart from this, the parish takes in the neighbouring hamlets of Soutergate, Wall End, Beckside, Sandside, Marshgate and Chapels. English sailor and tradesman Barnet Burns was born in the village. In 1805, the first European citizen to live in Maori, New Zealand, and the first to receive a full facial tattoo. Every so often we pass pink signs which illustrates Say No to Giant Pylons, headed by the organisation group Power Without Pylons. The National Grid proposes to build 50 metre giant pylons between Sellafield and Haysham as part of the Moorside Nuclear Power Station project. The route of the electric wire would cross over the Duddon estuary and these would be seen all around the area ruining the landscape. Friends of the Lake District, a charity protecting the landscape of the National Park, also work closely with this organisation. Feasible alternatives for power to be transferred to and from Sellafield and Haysham is by tunnels beneath Morecambe Bay and the Duddon estuary. Now we enter the narrowest part of the road at Dove Ford as it becomes single track with 30 miles per hour maximum. Coming face to face with a HGV along this section is an unnerving experience. Grisbeck is described as a hamlet. A large HGV tow vehicle passes us through this narrow vicinity. Now we connect with the A5092 from the right, running east, and makes a connection with the A590 just after Ulverston. like these are magnificent, and giant pylons over this part would be disheartening and austere. now passing around the boundary of the Duddon Mosses Natural Nature Reserve, a perfect place for the wild and rare animals of this area. Birds of prey such as buzzards and barn owls take advantage of the mosses to hunt for small mammals, whereas other birds use the waters for peace and tranquility. Rent 
entered the village of Foxfield. Coming alongside us to the left for a short distance is the Cumbrian Coast Railway Line. Straight ahead is Foxfield Station, just in time to see a Class 37 diesel locomotive backpowering four Mark II coaches en route to Barrow, having left Carlisle at 9.28. Since 2015, there has been four trains a day between Carlisle and Barrow that have these locomotives on hire from direct rail services, plus the coaches to provide additional seating capacity on the line, very useful in the summer months. The railway curves away immediately to the west, crossing over the mouth of the Duddon, whilst we travel northwards en route to the town of Broughton in Furness. Mention must be made about the town of Broughton in Furness, Foxfield Road, which we shall see shortly is where motorists can diverge towards Broughton in Furness. This town dates from the early 11th century when Saxons first invaded the land. King George III awarded the town its market charter back in 1810. The market square is the main tourist attraction as it hosts its annual market including the reading of the charter on the 1st of August. This single track road is controlled by traffic lights carrying the road over Duddon Bridge that crosses the Duddon River. The Duddon runs for 15 miles from the Pike of Blisco, a mountain at 705 metres or 2,313 foot above sea level, before entering the Irish Sea at the Furness Peninsula. Diverging here to the right is single track road crossing over the Corny Fells, a sparsely inhabited area with its derelict buildings and broken walls, though it's a popular route for walkers hiking across the rugged terrain. Our route now includes tight bends and stiff gradients as we run around the foothills of the fells. road is the A5093 which we shall join again further on. It leads to the town of Millam and to the aggregate quarry known as Gill Scar. A steep gradient of 15% or 1 in 5.6 descends downwards towards the woodlands and foothills of the Black Comb. 
somewhere in the surrounding woodlands, is Brockwood Hall, a manor house dating from 1884 that has connections with many notable people, such as Beatrix Potter, who once stayed here. The road now runs alongside the foothills of Black Coombe, having an altitude of 600 metres, or 1,968 foot above sea level. It's said that at the top of the peak, five kingdoms can be witnessed. England, Scotland, Ireland, the Isle of Man, and Heaven. The peak can be seen from miles around, even as far as Wales, and impressive views can be seen here in the town of Millen. The small coastal town back in the day only had a few sets of houses and farms to its name. Nevertheless, it wasn't until 1855 that iron ore was discovered from the nearby Hodbarrow Quarry. The statue in the town centre commemorates the ironworks that occurred here at the time, with the nearby Millen Museum recollecting relics from the past. Steel and iron ore works gradually disappeared from Millen, and today there is no steel or iron mining in the whole of Cumbria. At Sylecroft, we join up again with the A5093, some three and a half miles from Millen town centre. We take the right turn at the junction to head in a northerly direction back around the foothills of the Black Coombe, with the serve bends and gradients behind us for the time being. Fells is the Irish Sea, with the railway running just short of a quarter of a mile away before them. Bootle is a small village in the borough of Copeland. Ahead is the impressive St Michael's Church, constructed with a classic slate roof and red sandstone around the main building and tower, a feature of many of the buildings in Cumbria. Market Charter was awarded to the village in 1347, furthermore has been portrayed as the smallest market town in England.
our journey to Carlisle is in that of a Ford Fiesta. The Ford today dates from around 2014, from where all Fords built around 2008 onwards were known as sixth generation Fiestas, with different and rear facials. The engine is a 1.25 litre ZTEC, having been introduced in October 1998. Production of Fords began in 1974 and have now started to dispatch the seventh generation of Fiestas, or Mark 8, providing more room and comfort for the driver as well as the passengers. The impressive building to the left looks like a manor house, but in fact it's the Weber Bates Primary School. The road to Newbiggin is known as Stocksbridge, and a mile on passes beneath the Cumbrian coastline as it crosses the River Esk. In this rear view we can see the coastline and broad gentle waters of the sea.
We're now in the western valleys of Cumbria, which is twinned with a similar type of lake district in France called Saint Martin d'Eugenie. bridge here crosses over the River Esk, being a much shorter crossing compared to the railway bridge that's measured at being a quarter mile long. An arduous climb now begins for the Fiesta, as it begins a mile climb of 6%, before a short section of 8% leading up to a summit near Muncaster. Reaching the summit of the climb, we descend down again at 6% and pass the entrance of Muncaster Castle, a historic and haunted place that dates from around its construction in 1208. This was by the Pennington family, with many suggesting that the family have been here from an even earlier date to an estimate of the year 1026. The castle is still accommodated today and the family welcomes a plethora of guests into the home so that tourists can discover much of the history and ghosts too that walk the corridors, a title of being the most haunted castle in England. Reports of screams, footsteps and things that go bump in the night have all been experienced here. The main A595 takes a 90 degree turn, whilst the road ahead leads to Ravenglass. Home today in Ravenglass is the Ravenglass and Eskdale Railway, which opened in 1873, with a primary job to transfer the iron ore from the quarries at Boot to the Furnace Railway, seen as an easy way to ship the iron to England's industrial towns. This is steam engine Northern Rock, a 24 foot long loco with a 262 wheel arrangement dating 1976. The signal box controls the whole line and is known as the Ratty Box, run by a group of dedicated volunteers since 1960. With the growing number of passengers during the summer months, revenue has hit an all time high and sees a healthy future for the next few years.
Passenger traffic began operating over the line in 1875 to 1908 and was the first ever public narrow gauge railway in Britain. With the decline of iron ore, the line closed in 1913, though it reopened again a couple of years later by Wenman Bassett Loke, who converted the line to 15 inch. Between both Ravenglass and Dalegarth, there are seven intermediate halts where passengers stop or alight by request only, so passengers can gain access to the many walks in the surrounding countryside. Trains terminate here at Dalegarth, surrounded by the Rocky Mountains, and also overlooked by England's highest mountain, Scaffold Pike, at 978 metres, or 3,209 foot. Oh, I mean, he's going back, yeah, he's going back on the train. Yeah, he's going back to the train. Here at the first stone bridge, we cross over the narrow gauge railway, and at the second one, we cross over the river Mitre. road junction leads into some of Cumbria's most beautiful countryside, ending up at Santon Bridge Hamlet. Kirklands is the name of this road, with the first couple of miles of its existence has an easy topography, as the land is relatively flat and straight. Quite ironic for a single track road with motorists being able to reach the maximum speed limit, when most of the time cars only ever seem to reach 40 or less. On the approach to Holmrook, the tight S-bend crosses over the River Ur on a bridge with two segmental arches. The village itself lives on the embankments of the Ur and the road parallels it to the end of the residential area. Gosforth Hall Hotel and the adjacent St Mary's Church hold a collection of Norse artefacts dating from the Viking era, and standing here in the churchyard is the Gosforth Cross, the tallest in Britain that remains from the period of time. The small hamlet takes its name from the River Calder and the bridge that we cross. Calder Bridge, though, is notable for the three mansions that are situated nearby, Calder Abbey, Pelham House and Cellar Park. Sellafield was the world's first nuclear power station, opening in 1956 with an area of 6 square kilometres, hosting 10,000 workers and is still home to the largest inventories of waste in the world. 
Before nuclear power, the site was used as a Royal Ordnance Factory in the 1940s to aid the war efforts. The first exit at the roundabout leads towards the power station and the railway station. Cumbria County Council came into existence in 1974 by the Local Government Act of 1972. The county is split into six main districts. These include Barrow, Carlisle, Allerdale, Eden, South Lakeland and the one we're currently travelling through, Copeland. With inhabitants scattered all over the place, the county holds a population altogether of 498,000 since the 2015 census. But nonetheless, it's popular for its tourist trade, with the rolling mountains, green meadows and seaside resorts. track road leads off to St Bees and Beckermet. The former notable for the headland of St Bees, a cliff face allowing walkers to discover some spectacular views of the Irish Sea. Other routes down here lead to the less populated areas of Braystones and Nethertown, which coincidentally have stations on the Cumbrian coastline, but service frequency of four trains a day. Thornhill to the left. Egremont lies at the foot of the Old Dale Valley. Like most of the towns in Cumbria, it had a long historical background with the iron ore industries, as well as the dyeing and weaving of clothes. Much of the town is still intact from 1200 with the main high street, with its wide Broadway opening out into the marketplace, when 1266, King Henry III gave the town its charter for its market, an annual fair to be held here in the town centre. A short stroll away from the town centre takes the tourist to the Egremont Castle, which dates from around 1135. It replaced the original wooden structure on a mount dating from 1092. now 42 miles from Carlisle. Another road leads to St Bees, where in the village centre is a surviving priory which dates from around 1120. Legend has it the patron saint of St Bees, who was actually called a Bega, is a shroud of mystery as it's believed she never existed. However, a story goes on to say she was an Irish princess who refused to marry the man of her father's choice and ran away washing up on the shore of St Bees. Living here as a hermit, she helped local people. She then moved away but left behind her arm bracelet where the first story comes from. Other speculated stories came about in 1539, suggesting that St Bega came to the area to open a nunnery and approached Lord Egremont for this request. The Lord laughed at the request, but did promise that she could have as much of the land as she wanted if it snowed and as much as it covered. The land apparently was covered in snow the next day, but a day which is virtually impossible as it was a midsummer's day. Here at the traffic lights is the Westlake Science and Technology Park, housing a scattered amount of office blocks for different companies who work on the research of nuclear energy and of course science.
entered suburbia at Whitehaven. Whitehaven became a fishing village until the 17th century. It sits on the western coast of the Lake District for when the port became an important development to export the rich lock deposits of coal, tobacco and iron ore. Moresby Hall and St Mary's Church at Moresby overlook the sea. It was in Whitehaven that the first deep sea mine was discovered in 1729. By 1931 it had the novelty of being the deepest in the world. With the decline of all the myriad of businesses in the area, the town boasts a number of museums and tours around the harbour, with other local attractions being centres inland. Meanwhile, back on the open road, since 2008, the Distington Bypass was constructed, reducing journey times. For the next five miles, the road becomes a dual carriageway, and we can increase to 70 miles per hour throughout its length. carriageway section doesn't end here at the roundabout and so we continue to the next roundabout. On either side the road passes through the Lily Hall industrial estate. Lily Hall roundabout is where the A596 begins, as now roads northeast towards Workington. Workington. Iron and steel has always been part of Workington's heritage, but like Barrow, Millham and Whitehaven, the industry declined and has now gone from Cumbria. of treasured buildings of Workington Hall still stands today as a Grade 1 listed building. Completed in 1404, it's worth noting that the building has had a famous guest stay here in 1568, none other than Mary Queen of Scots. She resided here not long before her execution in London. The River Derwent flows undisturbed into the sea, having flowed from the spring underneath Scaffold Pike. We now merge to become part of the A66 at the roundabout. The road has now left the coast behind and runs inland for the next remaining 30 miles to Carlisle.
This significantly high structured road bridge takes us over the river Maron. Out of view behind the trees to the left, the road comes into close proximity with the river Derwent, which now meanders a few times before entering the sea. The A66 runs for 115 miles in length from the town centre at Workington to Middlesbrough via Scott Corner in the east. In fact, the road closed in 2015 due to excessive flooding that caused damage to the road surface and embankments. The road reopened in 2016. A66 behind as it continues to Cockermouth whilst we cross the Derwent at Pat Castle Bridge. The six mile long A594 takes the first exit here towards Maryport. Surprisingly, this is one of two A roads that take the same number. The other is located in Leicester as the city's ring road. The original A594 used to run to Penrith, but this has since been converted to the A66.
Having encountered hills, stiff gradients and severe bends, the roads take a more softer approach and the car speed begins to increase as we enter rare stretches of dead straight road. The only section that was planned to remain as a trunk road was to be between Chapel Brow to Lily Hall, extending onwards to Calder Bridge. Despite spirited opposition from the County Council, the road was modified, but today, 18 miles from Little Clifton, the westerly end of the A66 junction, to Calder Bridge remains as a trunk route. It could once again be known as a trunk road throughout, from Carlisle to Barrow, if plans go ahead to build three new nuclear power stations. This dead straight section is rare on the A595, and runs for a couple of miles as far as the Muta Garden Centre. Muta, the straightness ends here. A wind farm overlooks the road, generating electricity the environmentally friendly way. Bothell lies on the edge of the Lake District and is where the A591 begins linking the village with Lake Bassenwaite and Keswick. We are now 18 miles from Carlisle. an Act from Parliament ordered a bypass to run from somewhere around here from the north of Egremont, reaching and joining the A596 at Aspatria. Possibly this could have been useful and deduct the long journey times, but the bypass never came into fruition.
This is Meals Gate. Travellers for Aspatria may take the left here and for Calderbeck on the opposite side of the staggered junction of the B5299. lies a mile from the A595. The medieval town was given market charter in 1262. Standing in the middle of the marketplace is the 19th century fountain designed by George Moore in memory of his wife. Also in the town is Highmore Mansion and its tower looms over the town. The structure was built in 1885 by brothers Edwin and Henry Banks with the clock tower and bell being referred to as Big Joe. Today, the former mansion has been converted into flats. Another rare section of the dead straight road now known as the Roman Road, suggesting it was they who first built the original section between Carlisle and Whitehaven, making this the oldest part of the A595. Curthwaite is the end of the straight section and we now traverse the broad sweeping curves to cross the Cumbrian coastline for the final time. 
A, sta a station was located here when it was opened by the Mary Port and Carlisle Railway in 1843, but it closed again in 1950. Impressive by all standards, this Gothic arch stands at the site of the one-time entrance of Crofton Hall Estate, which had been around since the 13th century. 3,000 acres of land used to be here, with farmhouses and small buildings also dotted around the area. The main building was sadly demolished in 1956, but features of the estate still remain along with the meadows, walled garden and woodlands. The A596 has now joined our formation, and so happens to actually replace the A595 coastal road, but in fact after it leaves Maryport, it too comes inland and runs a few miles to the north of our road, mainly paralleling the railway line. The final stretch of straight road takes us all the way to our journey's end at Carlisle. roundabout leads off to Great Orton and Dalston. The former had a nightmare of a time in 2001, with the former airfield that had been built in 1943 becoming a burial ground with the outbreak of the foot and mouth disease in livestock. 893 of these animals suffered at the hands of foot and mouth and that was only Cumbria, as 2,030 others had suffered at the hands of it as well. A sad story.
Carlisle, the 30 miles per hour speed limit now applies and we continue into the city centre. Urbanisation has now begun. Carlisle is the border city and the furthest north in England. It's also the county town of Cumbria, of which most of all the shops and commercial centres are based here. The first people to settle here were the Romans, who built forts around the famous Hadrian's Wall. Carlisle Castle is still today a great fortress that has stood over the city for nearly nine centuries. Today the castle is a museum of the border regiment. The 19th century welcomed the arrival of the railways, which many companies began life here. The station building, designed by Sir William Tite, is the beginning point of the 72 mile long Settle and Carlisle line. Finally, the Citadel, the former southern entrance to the city, which one of the towers you see today is open to the public. A fitting end to our journey. The A595 connects the city with the coast and tourist resorts.